Thank you, Emily. Could I ask everyone to be seated? The Prince of Wales will now officially welcome us to Buckingham Palace today. Your Majesty, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very special pleasure to be here with you all this morning and to join Her Majesty the Queen in welcoming each of you to Buckingham Palace for the formal opening of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. This is an occasion to celebrate with renewed pride our remarkable Commonwealth family, particularly as it follows so hard on the heels of the 21st Commonwealth Games on Australia's Gold Coast, at the opening of which I was proud to have been asked to represent Her Majesty. Witnessing this great gathering of 71 countries and territories and meeting their athletes in the Games Village was, above all, a moving reminder of the strong and affectionate bonds which we all share. For my part, the Commonwealth has been a fundamental feature of my life for as long as I can remember, beginning with my first visit to Malta when I was just five years old. I consider myself fortunate over the years to have been able to meet and talk with so many of the giants of the Commonwealth, Sir Robert Menzies, Kwame Nkrumah, Sir Keith Holyoke, Jomo Kenyatta, Pierre Trudeau, Kenneth Kaunda, Julius Nereri, Lee Kuan Yew, and many more. On the foundations they laid, the modern Commonwealth has a vital role to play in building bridges between our countries, fairer societies within them, and a more secure world around them. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I pray that this Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting will not only revitalize the bonds between our countries, but will also give the Commonwealth a renewed relevance to, its, to all its citizens, finding practical solutions to their problems and giving life to their aspirations. By doing so, the Commonwealth can be a cornerstone for the lives of future generations, just as it has been for so many of us. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. The UK is delighted to host the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting of Ch or Chogham in the UK for the first time since 1997. One constant throughout the Commonwealth's remarkable history has been the dedication, insight, and experience that the Queen has given. The role she's played is much admired. The formal opening has always served as a vibrant and visible expression of our diversity, and the ceremony this year is inspired by the theme towards a common future. You will now hear a musical performance from six singers drawing on vocal styles and traditions from around the Commonwealth. The performance has been created especially for today and is based on a song that's become a youth anthem unwritten.
try are outside the line. We've been conditioned to not make mistakes, but I can't live that way. Staring at the blank page before you, open up the dirty window, let the sun illuminate the words that you cannot find. the blank page before you open up the dirty window let the sun illuminate the words that you cannot find reaching for something in the distance so close you can almost taste it release your inhibitions feel the rain on your skin no one else can feel it for you only you can let Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite the host of the summit, the Right Honourable Theresa May, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, to speak. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, Secretary General, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely proud to be welcoming you all to London the first full heads of government meeting here in almost 40 years. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Prime Minister Muscat and his team. Thank you for your incredible hard work. You represent a Commonwealth truth that the size of a country does not limit its ambition and impact. I hope that over the coming days and months, we can build on the work you have begun as we forge a future for our common good. Over many decades, this organization has brought together nations, young and old, large and small, to celebrate our common bonds and to work to our mutual benefit. There have been difficulties, successes, controversies, but I believe wholeheartedly in the good that the Commonwealth can do. And this week, as young people from our many nations gather and contribute their views, our responsibility as leaders is to ensure their voices are heard and to build a Commonwealth that we can be proud to hand on to the next generation. For in the Commonwealth, we have an incredible opportunity. An opportunity to show just what can be achieved through coordinated action and cooperation to seize the possibilities open to us as member countries and together 
to take on some of the 21st century's biggest questions. How we support our most vulnerable member states as we tackle climate change and improve the health of our oceans, creating a more sustainable Commonwealth. How we develop through trade, pushing back against protectionism for a more prosperous Commonwealth. How we respond to threats to the rules-based international order and from cyber attacks, creating a more secure Commonwealth. And how, in all of this, we advance those common values which our organisation has always stood for – democracy, human rights, tolerance and the rule of law – so that we establish a fairer Commonwealth. These are problems nations cannot solve alone, but by working together we can make a real difference. Over the past three days, we have seen the power of the Commonwealth in action at the forums for business leaders, young people, women and civil society. These discussions have demonstrated the vibrancy and creativity of our organisation, focusing on issues such as improving trade, youth unemployment, education and health, all of which have the potential to transform people's lives. And I'm looking forward to taking these issues further with the heads of government over the next two days. Finally, on behalf of all of you assembled here in Buckingham Palace, I want to offer my heartfelt thanks to Your Majesty, Head of the Commonwealth. This week, you have opened your homes to us here in London and in Windsor. Over many years, you have been the Commonwealth's most steadfast and fervent champion. You have been true to the deepest values of the Commonwealth, that the voice of the smallest member country is worth precisely as much as that of the largest, that the wealthiest and the most vulnerable stand shoulder to shoulder. You have seen us through some of our most serious challenges, and we commit to sustaining this Commonwealth which you have so carefully nurtured for your service, for your dedication, for your constancy, we thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. We will now hear from the Commonwealth Secretary-General, the Right Honourable Patricia Scotland. Your Majesties, Royal Highnesses, Excellences, Distinguished Delegates, Friends and Colleagues. Our presence in this place, united in purpose and aware of the many millions we represent, is a supreme expression of faith in the Commonwealth, a Commonwealth of people. We have unparalleled ability to draw together streams of wisdom from secular sources and from diverse traditions of religious and philosophical thought and practice. Our values and aspirations are expressed in the Commonwealth Charter, signed by the Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, to whom we owe an untold debt of gratitude, both as a symbol of our free association and through deep personal identification with the highest ideals of respect and understanding. Her Majesty has won a place of great affection in the hearts of people in all countries of the Commonwealth. On occasions such as this, 
we become freshly aware of relationships we cherish and of inheritances being carried forward by successive generations. New energy and vitality are added as younger members take up responsibility and become active within the circuitry of Commonwealth connection. Commonwealth heads of government meetings are distinctive for being both receptive and responsive to the needs of all, especially the young, the marginalised and the vulnerable. Our dialogue is different because there is a special dynamic in our Commonwealth ecosystem. We can think back to the Lankawi Declaration on the Environment made at the 1989 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malaysia. A visionary and pioneering statement and that early blossom now bears fruit in initiatives such as the Queen's Commonwealth Canopy and our current work on the Commonwealth Blue Charter and the Blue Economy. Such continuing abundance and productivity depend on processes of refreshment and renewal that are essential for the continuing vitality and development of any organism. Numerous examples show Commonwealth synergy accelerating progress to tackle climate change and plastic pollution, to eliminate child, early and forced marriage and modern slavery, to eradicate polio and malaria, and to reduce the prevalence of non-communicable diseases. Upholding democracy, the rule of law and human rights. Ha hastening these processes, we now have the Commonwealth Innovation Hub and the Commonwealth Office of Civil and Criminal Justice Reform. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is a springboard for action. It is the launch pad that propels us onward, upward, forward, together. We are the believers. We believe in the Commonwealth. We have faith in the Commonwealth that it will continue to adapt and thrive, becoming ever more fit for purpose, innovating and collaborating, united in our determination to be as responsive as we are inclusive, towards a common future. Thank you, Secretary General. You'll see that there are a number of young leaders who are with us today, and two of them will now share their remarkable Commonwealth stories. Devika Malik and PJ Cole are recipients of the Queen's Young Leaders Award, which celebrates ex exceptional people who are using their skills to transform lives in their own communities and to drive change across the Commonwealth. I now invite Devika and PJ to tell us about their experiences. I am a para-athlete with a congenital disability. My mother, who also has a disability, became India's first female Paralympic medalist. Together, we established the Wheeling Happiness Foundation. Our aim is to give young people with disabilities confidence and independence through sport and equip them with life skills. We also work with schools and employers to break down barriers of attitude as well as physical ones. It can transform lives. One of our beneficiaries, Shweta, was abandoned by her husband after polio progressed and left her unable to walk. With our support, she took up sports. Over the last two years, this single mother of two has emerged as a self-reliant sportswoman 
with national and international medals to her credit. As a member of the Commonwealth Youth Sports for Development and Peace Working Group, I have made connections with others in my field who share the same objectives. As a Queen's young leader, I have been able to meet and collaborate with young people making improvements in the lives of their own communities. Last week, at the Commonwealth Games in Australia, inspiring para-athletes were in action, achieving extraordinary things, demonstrating abilities beyond their disabilities. The Commonwealth is a pioneer in recognizing that the youth are leaders of today, not tomorrow. Young community leaders with disabilities gathered for a round table on Monday to discuss their vision for an inclusive common future. There is a growing commitment from Commonwealth governments towards empowering people with disabilities. My experience is testament that when people with disabilities have a voice, the society is a richer place. Thank you. I now hand over to PJ. Thank you, Devika. I would like to share with you the remarkable story of how a group of former child soldiers have become community leaders and are rebuilding their nation. Back in 1996, moved by the plight of child soldiers in Sierra Leone, my parents invited over 800 young people into our lives. All were victims of war. Pulling them out of the conflict and into our home, I shared my clothes, food, and parents with them. Although they had committed many atrocities, my father had the vision that with the right support and education, these young people will go on to be those who would rebuild the nation in years to come. Today, a group of these former child soldiers with whom I shared my life are now standing shoulder to shoulder with me. And together, we're running four schools, a safe home and a vocational training center. We're working with farmers, running businesses, rebuilding Sierra Leone. Faced with the atrocities of the Ebola disease in 2014, our team of former child soldiers started a new fight to end Ebola. We designed an Ebola education program which equipped over 100,000 people with life-saving knowledge. We provided support to over 12,000 quarantined individuals. We also partnered with others to build an Ebola treatment center which treated over 270 people. In the last six years, we've had to deal with Ebola, cholera, floods, and most recently, a mudslide that killed over a thousand people and left many young children orphaned. We have also supported colleagues in the UK, in Mozambique, and in Dominica in diverse ways. See, during this week's youth forum, a colleague pointed out to me that it is time to move away from merely talking about including young people to recognizing that our young people in the Commonwealth are proffering solutions to some of the biggest challenges that face us. And my experience bears that out. Thank you. Thank you, PJ and Devika. Your courage and your determination inspire us all. I'd now like to invite Dr. Joseph Muscat, Prime Minister of Malta, to speak. Your Majesty, Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It has been quite a journey since we last met in Malta more than two years ago. The world is a different place. Things we took for granted are now rooted in deep uncertainty. 
And while progress continues to be achieved, this is uneven and unleveled. Despite this, the Commonwealth, our Commonwealth, is experiencing a rekindled interest, with our family growing and positive changes happening. As Malta concludes its term as chair for the second time in a decade, we wish the United Kingdom the very best for the two years ahead. I will not list the achievements and the works in progress. Instead, I would rather conclude our term by touching upon a central theme we addressed during our meeting in Valletta, that of equality. While respecting our different cultures and backgrounds, the Commonwealth must be a force that nudges and encourages its members to embrace this fundamental value. By standing together, our Commonwealth has fought proudly for equality amongst different races at a time when such equality could not be taken for granted. That is a feather in our cap. But we have to remind ourselves that equality is not a relative value. We cannot be in favor of one type of equality and ambivalent or against another. That is why Malta believes that the advocacy for gender equality and equal rights for the LGBTIQ community should remain firmly on the Commonwealth agenda. Not to point fingers or cross swords, but to assist decision makers, engage with communities, and promote best practices. We can register progress with brave steps taken in some of the members in our family. But there are still too many of our sisters and brothers who are criminalized, discriminated against, or even subjected to violence. If there is at least one takeaway from our term as chair, we hope it is this, and that the engagement continues. Finally, Your Majesty, allow me to thank you for your personal interest, the interest you take in our Commonwealth. As proud, independent nations, we look at your leadership of our family as an honor you are affording us. When your father, His Majesty King George, started what he started, you have not only continued, but also elevated to unprecedented levels. We are equally elated by the vigor with which His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, actively participates in Commonwealth affairs and puts a strong Commonwealth dimension in his various national and global initiatives. We are certain that when he will be called upon to do so, he will provide a solid and passionate leadership for our Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. It's now my great privilege to invite Your Majesty, as the Head of the Commonwealth, to address us. Prime Minister Muscat, Prime Minister May, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen. Having on so many occasions 
been welcomed to opening ceremonies around the Commonwealth, it is a pleasure this time to welcome you to my own home. Here at Buckingham Palace in 1949, my father met the heads of government when they ratified the London Declaration, which created the Commonwealth as we know it today, then comprising just eight nations. Who then, or in 1952, when I became head of the Commonwealth, would have guessed that a gathering of its member states would one day number 53, or that it would comprise 2.4 billion people. Put simply, we are one of the world's great convening powers, a global association of volunteers who believe in the tangible benefits that flow from exchanging ideas and experiences and respecting each other's point of view. And we seem to be growing stronger year by year. The advantages are plain to see. An increasing emphasis on trade between our countries is helping us all to discover exciting new ways of doing business. And imaginative initiatives have shown how together we can bring about change on a global scale. The Commonwealth Canopy has emphasized our interdependence, while the Commonwealth Blue Charter promises to do the same in protecting our shared ocean resources. The Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust is providing life-changing eye treatment to many thousands through the generosity and cooperation of the nations represented here today. My family and I have been heartened by these and many other programs in which we are proud to play a part. I'm glad to see that young people connecting through technology are becoming ever more involved. When I meet the young leaders of this century, I remember my own lifelong commitment made in South Africa in 1947 at the age of 21. As another birthday approaches this week, I am reminded of the extraordinary journey we have been on and how much good has been achieved. It remains a great pleasure and honour to serve you as head of the Commonwealth and to observe with pride and satisfaction that this is a flourishing network. It is my sincere wish that the Commonwealth will continue to offer stability and continuity for future generations, and will decide that one day the Prince of Wales should carry on the important work started by my father in 1949. By continuing to treasure and reinvigorate our associations and activities, I believe we will secure a safer, more prosperous and sustainable world for those who follow us a world where the Commonwealth's generosity of spirit can bring its gentle touch of healing and hope to all. Mindful, as always, that this summit of Commonwealth leaders draws its mandate and authority from our member countries collectively, it gives me great pleasure to declare this meeting of the Commonwealth Heads of Government open. Your Majesty, thank you. We will now celebrate the Commonwealth's musical connections with an instrumental collaboration which draws on a range of folk styles and features musicians from across the Commonwealth. Please now enjoy this musical performance of Shepherd's Hay.
Thank you. That concludes the formal proceedings. However, in time-honoured Commonwealth tradition, we'll now take a brief pause for the family photograph with Your Majesty and with all the heads of government. This is a historic moment captured at every Commonwealth heads of government meeting since they began. Thank you, Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We wish you well for a successful and productive day of discussions. If I could now ask you to stand for the departure of Her Majesty, the Queen, members of the Royal Family, and our heads of government.